one, two, three, four, five, six uh, slip planes that are basically intersecting every uh, one, one, one uh, directions. So if you look down the, for instance, if, if I were to look down this axis, yes, I would, I would basically see uh, six, oops, six, uh, one, one, oh, plane. So this would be a, a, a one, one, one direction. And, and these would be three, um, one, one, oh, planes. Yes. And in between these one, one, oh, planes, there are also one, one, two planes. Yes. So principle, a dislocation that's oriented along this axis can, can just move into any uh, one of these planes, what many options to, uh, and it does that very easily because it's not, these dislocations are not dissociated. So let's, um, let's put up uh, the slides here. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, um, Things are very slow today. It must be Friday afternoon. Even, uh, even our systems are slow. Okay. All right. We have that. Okay. It's a cross slip. Good. There we go. Okay. So, so this is what uh, what I was telling you. Uh, that you can have cross slip and the dislocations, uh, screw dislocations in BCC uh, alpha iron will easily do this because they're not dissociated. In the case of FCC, it can equally be easy, but the material has to have a high stacking fault energy, yes? not to be, the, the dislocation shouldn't be dissociated. And, and if you remember, uh, what was a high stacking fault energy? Well, there was of d about 100 millijoules per square meter. Okay. Now, um, up to now, we've, we've, we've discussed uh, dislocations that dissociate, dislocations that exert uh, uh, forces on each other, mm. um, but what happens if um, if this location crash into each other? You know, they run run into each other, and um, so what happens? Uh, well, uh, in specific cases, we get junctions. Two dislocations will uh, form a third dislocation, and uh, whether or not this happens depends on the um, the B square criteria, yes, okay. Uh, so one of the um, the th uh, junctions that uh, is and, okay, and then when when two dislocations um, uh, uh, react together, usually it's only a piece of their their whole length that reacts together, yes, th where they meet, and um, so you form a third dislocation. And it may be that this third dislocation uh, does not move as easily as the two other segments hmm? for reasons uh, maybe related to the structure or for intrinsic reasons because, for instance, the Burgers factor of the dislocation is not a glide. It's, it's, it, it doesn't make it a glide dislocation. Hmm? Okay? And so that means that these junctions will act as pinning points, more or less strong pinning points. Okay? And, it, and it's a very important aspect of strain hardening, hmm? that, you know, what happens when dislocations uh, meet each other. So, so one of the um, uh, dislocation junctions um, is uh, or product of uh, dislocation reaction. They're very important for strain hardening, as I said. Um, and, um, 
And some of these dislocation junctions can be sessile. In this, uh, dislocation uh, people, they, they uh, will say a dislocation is glissile, that means it can move, or it's sessile. If it's sessile, it's just like, it's a dislocation that just doesn't move, right? It's, it's very strongly pinned, yes? And uh, it doesn't matter how much tr uh, stress you apply, it just cannot move, yeah? Um, right. uh, so, um, and uh, because this junction uh, can be sessile, uh, it will take a lot of force to get the rest of the dislocations to move, and they will act also as barriers to other dislocations. So that all increases the flow stress, strain hardening, in other words. Yeah? So one, one of these common junctions in BCC iron is the A upon 2 one zero zero uh, dislocation junction, hmm? and it's formed simply by having two coplanar screw dislocations react. And the reaction is, a, uh, I'll, I'll illustrate it in a moment. Um, so a upon two uh, one one bar one plus a upon two one bar one one. If you uh, sum these two vectors, you get you should get. Um, so A upon 2, 200, or A100. Mm? Okay, so this is a, a, a different burger. You can see it's a very different burger's vector than this one, right? Okay. So uh, first of all, the question is, you, you can write uh, thousands of these reactions if you want, right? Uh, whether or no, not they will happen, you check this by b doing the B square criteria. Okay, so check the B square. So b square of the first uh, uh, dislocation, b square of the second dislocation, of course, the same. Sum that, uh, and you find uh, uh, 1.5 times a square, and that's obviously larger than a square, right? So, so yes, the reaction is energetically favorable. So it will, it will happen. And, uh, and, and it does happen in practice. Um, so if, if here I have an array of screw dislocations, <coughs> excuse me, uh, screw dislocations, these are dislocations lines, yes, on a uh, 011 plane here, so once uh, uh, one of these screw sets of dislocations has, screw dislocation has this Burgess factor, A upon 2, 1, 1 minus 1, and the other set is A upon 2, 1 bar 1, 1, and where they meet, yes, they can form a one uh, a one o o dislocation. Yes, and and you see this this actually happens in practice. Uh, you see here this dislocation screw dislocations in uh, BCC iron, actually a ferritic steel. Yeah, and in certain areas these dislocations will form this kind of uh, honeycomb pattern. Yes, uh, where uh, these uh, these little segments here are uh, these A100 uh, junctions, okay? So, um, uh, let me yeah, pen here. How does this, this work? So again, you can, you can use this uh, very uh, simply. Let's see, uh, right. I'm going to put this like this, yeah? Uh, and the reason why, I just want you to look, if you look this way, Yes, at uh, this dodecahedron, you sh it's square, right? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't look hexagonal, right? And that's because we're looking down a 100 direction, okay? So I'm going to put this like this up, up here, yeah? And um, so if, uh, uh, yeah, so, so, th so this guy is a, a Z direction, this guy is a X direction, this guy's a Y direction. And so this plane here is one, um, one, one O direction, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I told you that all these uh, edges here are, are Burgers factor for this, this glide plane, okay? So um, what, what we basically have here, so let, I have to make a drawing then, so let me draw, uh, just turn it around. So, um, so say we have screw dislocations like this, right? Hmm? Um, that have a Burgers vector as, as this. Yeah? Hmm? And you have, oops, screw dislocations like this, yeah? which have a Burgers vector like this. 
All right. Okay. So, um, okay. So now I'm going back here. Yeah. Um, this vector here and this vector here. Yes. Let's make the sum of these two vectors. So the sum of these two vectors is this. This is the same one here, right? So 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 this plus this. Yes. Is right. Uh, this is not the right one. Um, not the right, this is not the right reaction. It's one of the, re I didn't want to do this, but anyway, it's, it's very good that it happened. So um, if I, let's, let me correct this. So if this, the Burgess factor of these guys are like this, yes, and the Burgess factor of this, of uh, these guys is in this direction, then I have this Burgess factor and this Burgess. So the sum of these two is this one here, right? And, and, and so it's, and it's parallel to this, this z direction, right? Okay. Okay. And, 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 so the, and this is an a um, uh, one zero zero one type of Burgess vector. Okay. You you had seen that originally. I mean, it wasn't intended. I had put this point in this direction, and when I try to react them, I, mean, I get this vector. Yeah. So that. That wouldn't happen because the, the b squared would not be uh, uh, smaller. But it's a possibility. As I said, you know, you can do any type of reactions you want. So, um, so, so this will only happen, you know, for these two specific uh, Burgess factors, and they have to be in the screw orientation. So, uh, uh, yes. Okay. So that's, that's basically what I wanted to to say. That's one type of a junction, um, which is common in uh, the BCC. Um, in FCC, it's a, a lot more difficult to uh, make a quick drawing, like uh, for for reasons uh, uh, related to the fact that our dislocation are dissociated. So I, I've I've tried to do this here. Hmm? for what is known as a, a lomer cottrell junction, usually short LC junction, yeah? And uh, what, basically, uh, what, what you're basically looking at is the, the reaction of, let's illustrate this with my, yeah? It's, it's basically like this, so you've got um, this glide, this white plane is a uh, glide plane, it's this one here, this plane here, and on my tetra, tetrahedron, yes, uh, and I use my tetrahedron to have another uh, one, one, one uh, plane, and, and that's, that's this guy here, this guy. As you can see they intersect here, huh? and they have, um, so here they, they have a, a common uh, 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 line. Yeah? Right, so, so what, we, what we're basically describing is I have a dislocation here, yes, yeah, like this, yeah, that um, interacts, yes, with a, um, a dislocation on, the, on this plane here. Okay. In, in the way that is shown here, yeah, and in the way it's in the drawing, they intersect here. Right. So this this dislocation meets this guy. Okay. Okay. Right. So in this in this particular case, yeah, what happens, of course, is um, so this is the stacking fault. Yeah. Right. And this is the stacking fault for this dislocation. This dislocation here will, when they intersect, yeah, this is it meets this guy. Yes. Yeah. And in certain cases, not you know, there are many possibilities. Yes. But in certain cases, a um, dislocation will be formed here at this intersection, which has 
et the uh, the Burgess factor is delta alpha. Yeah. Okay. Delta alpha, and that is a see delta alpha. Delta alpha. Yeah. Is you can see this. Yes. Is a Burgess factor. Yes. Yes, it's, it's a dislocation which does not belong to, which does not lie, excuse me, in the ABC plane, and it doesn't lie on the um, BCD plane either, right? So when you have a dislocation with the Burgess factor, yes, yes, that's not part of the glide plane then the dislocation cannot move, right? Because it, 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 it you know, the dislocation has to, has to move inside its glide plane, so the Burgess factor must be parallel, at least parallel to the glide plane, yes? So when the, the, the Burgess factor is perpendicular uh, to the glide plane or, or at an angle, yes, it's just stuck, right? Because it, it can't go anywhere. It's not, it's, it's not on its glide plane. And you have very sessile junction. Yeah? Now, I need to check something here because if A delta. Right, so this, this is. Yeah, so do you have your notes? Did somebody print his. Um, print this thing from uh, E class? If you did, you should check this reaction here. Because it needs, it should be delta B plus A delta, right? And it's, it's there's something else, I don't know uh, why, but, uh, okay. Right. Okay. And that's what we call a, a, a lomer Cottrell lock, yeah? Mm -hmm. so it's, And what is interesting at this lomer cottrell lock is that this is the, this is this entire piece is called uh, lomer cottrell lock is that it consists of three pure edge dislocations. So that means the Burgess factor is perpendicular to the line direction. Yeah. Okay, very strong junction, and. Um, So dislocations can interact. They do so in BCC iron and gamma iron in a different way. Mm? Um, in BCC we get these um, A100 type Burgess factor. In uh, FCC, austenitic steels, we get lomer cottrell locks. In BCC um, there are also interesting things that, and, and FCC, uh, that happen. And that, um, uh, those are things called jogs. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So usually we think of dislocations as being in the glide plane. Yes? But they can, parts of it can move to a different glide plane. And we've already seen that that can happen, for instance, when you get cross slip. And when you get cross slip, so if, let me go back here, if I have uh, a dislocation here, yes, like this, which, which cross slips, yeah, yeah, to this plane here, yeah, I, I create and the dislocation, the screw dislocation then goes on to go back to a parallel plane, yes, like this. So it goes from, it's on this uh, plane, it cross slips on this one, and then it cross slips back on a parallel plane, yes. Then 
these pieces of dislocations here, these pieces we call jogs, yes? This is the Burgess vector, B. This is the line direction, the original line direction. This is, of course, the line. The dislocation line now goes like this. Now, what is important is that if you look at these jogs, the, the dislocation, whatever it does, it, it always keeps its Burgers factor, yes? It's, it's always the same Burgers factor. Here, it's a screw dislocation. Here, it's a screw dislocation. But at the jog, it's an edge dislocation, right? It's an edge dislocation, yes? And these, um, and, and we call this jogs. And as a re so these are very tiny things. I mean, uh, they, you know, they're not more than a few uh, lattice planes high, these jogs. So you can't really see them um, in, the, in the TM. But you can see the direct consequence of their presence. And the, the, for instance, you get these things, yes? And this is obviously something happens to this dislocation, which makes it go here and then go back and so forth. Well, what is it? It's just a point where the dislocation is stuck, yes? And it continues to move and it trails behind it two dislocations, or well, itself going towards that pinning point and away from it. So, and we call this a dipole, hmm? dipole. So dipoles, when you see dipoles in your, in your microstructure, and you, there are quite a few here, right? You see one here, a few here, yes. You know that here hmm, there is a jog on this dislocation. It's a small bit of uh, uh, edge dislocation uh, that keeps, uh, that pins the dislocation there. Another um, effect of the presence of jogs are these little loops. You see here, uh, this is a structure and it's lots of loops, lots of little, this is a very nice one here, you can see lots of this. All right, and we call this, uh, it has a name, we call it debris, debris. Mm -hmm. All right, so how um, do we form uh, these jogs. Hmm? Well, you can form jogs as a result of cross-slip, yes, and we've already seen, uh, yes, or you can form jogs as a result of dislocations intersections, yes. So these are two possibilities. Hmm? Let's first have a look at the, the cross-slip. Hmm? Hmm? So, say um, a dislocation um, forms this this would this thing here um, is is this is in this in the slip plane of my dislocation. This is not a, a, a um, this is not a jog. These are not jogs. These are just kinks. When the dislocation, uh, very, very uh, careful here. I right? don't don't get your words mi mixed up. So this say if this is a a glide plane, yeah. Uh, your dislocation, say your, your screw dislocation here, yeah? mm -hmm. uh, when it moves, um, it, it, will, it will move like this, right? It'll get larger, for instance, right? But if you, if you look very, very careful, it's a really high magnification, if you could do this, right? What you would find out is that uh, the dislocations actually jump a little bit, pieces of them jump, yes? from what we call from one Pyrrhals valley to the other. Yeah? And these little pieces of dislocation that you form, those are called kinks, okay? So they have nothing to do with, the, uh, they're not related to the, uh, the jogs here, right? Which, which are connecting pieces of the dislocation from one glide plane to the other glide plane, okay? And the jogs are, uh, have very low mobility. And, and they act as a pinning point, the edge jogs, hmm? all right? Um, so, we, uh, right, so, so what, you, what you get is you can form a kink on the glide plane, but if it's a screw dislocation, 
there's nothing that prevents it from forming a kink on another slip plane, right? So for instance here, this is a screw dislocation. Right? You have these three or six 110 planes, yes? And this the screw dislocation forms a kink on this glide plane, and it forms a kink on this glide plane, yes? Now these two kinks move towards each other, and they form a jog, right? So uh, this the jog, this edge jog here, which um, uh, pins the dislocation. So when the, the screw dislocation tries to continue moving, it drags this dislocation behind it. Yeah, this low mobility dislocation behind, and you get, excuse me, formation of this dipole. These two parallel dislocations. Yeah? All right. Another possibility is that dislocations cutting each other. Yeah? Okay. Uh, so here I have a screw dislocation, this guy here, and here I have a screw dislocation on another glide plane, on another uh, 110 type plane. Yeah? Okay. So let's assume this screw dislocation does not move. It does not move. Yeah? And this screw dislocation moves from right to left. Yeah? Okay. What what does it mean, this Burgers factor? It basically means that the crystals is shifted. Yes, when you pass the you, when you pass the pl the glide plane of the dislocation, you shift the, the crystal gets shifted. Yeah. So when this dislocation cuts through uh, this guy here, yes, it gets shifted. It gets shifted upward by this amount, yeah? Mm -hmm. And so it's the same dislocation, but it's, I have an edge jog in it. Mm -hmm. And again, so this is low mobility, yes? Acts as a pinning point. My screw dislocation can continue to move to the, to the left, and it trails these two pieces of dislocation behind it. Now, it's the, the, the dipole, the, dip, the screw dislocation is a screw dislocation. But the dipole, yes, you can see, has an edge, edge components, yes? So it means that you can think of it as an extra half plane inserted in the structure. Okay, and we'll come back to that in a moment. But first, um, I want to say, for instance, how do, how do we form these this so-called debris, you know, these little dislocation loops in deformed ferritic steels of, or um, uh, BCC iron? Well, um, th this happens when you form multiple uh, jogs. Hmm? Hmm? Uh, say, for instance, um, uh, uh, I have a, um, a screw dislocation that moves to the uh, to the left here, yes, and uh, this part of the dislocation, yes, goes through a number of jogs, yes, yes, and ends up on this glide plane, yes. Nothing prevents the other screw dislocation segment to go through also successive uh, jog formations, yes? And so they can meet up back, they can meet again at a higher level. And then they, they leave behind basically a dislocation loop, yes? Uh, let me explain this maybe with a simple situation, so I have this. So say I have a uh, dislocation yeah, forms a jog, a single one, yeah? Okay. So th this piece here is 
on a on a higher at a higher level, right? On a higher level, right? So 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 this dislocation piece of dislocation can move on and it drags this this thing behind it, yes? So when this moves on, it can also drag this. But I can this dislocation here can also form on itself a jog, yes? It can also create a jog. And rejoin this piece, yes? And so as a consequence, they will leave behind a, a dipole, hmm? a lone dipole. Hmm? And if I go back to some of the micrographs, you can see that that occurs apparently rather f frequently. Come on. Yeah, you, you can see here some of these dipoles, like this dipole here, this dipole, it seems like it's all by itself, right? Huh? So it can get pinched off. Yeah? You, 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 they can trail a, 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 a dipole and then the, the dipole can get pinched off. Huh? Huh? Okay, and these, these, these uh, loops here are basically uh, a, a relatively similar processes that create them. Right. Of course, you can imagine that if, if you have made a very large kink, uh, there is little chance that this dislocation will, by chance, by you know, statistical uh, chance, will, will rejoin the other one, you know, because it, it would have to make very specific uh, kinks. So what happens to a, um, a edge jog, yes, um, is uh, depends very much on the height of this these uh, these jogs. So one of the things that's um, interesting is that if you look at the uh, the dipole that is behind that is trailing behind these uh, screw dislocations with a jog, hmm, if you look down the this uh, the dipole here. This dipole can have an interstitial nature. It can look as if um, you, it consists of two edge dislocations oriented like this, or two uh, edge dislocations oriented like this. This means that the structure is as if you had made there is an extra half plane of atoms inside the dipole. This structure means that there is a missing row of atoms inside the dipole. So, it may sound strange, but dislocations create point defects this way. They, they, like, you know, they make vacancies. They make interstitials, yes? Um, it doesn't happen when the jog is very large, and then we, we, we talk about super jogs, and the super jogs, uh, they just act as, as pinning, pinning points, and the, 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 the screw dislocations uh, that are uh, hanging, uh, are, are uh, part of it, uh, associated with it, rather, uh, they behave as if, you know, the jog wasn't there, and they have this, this pinning point, yes. Uh, and actually, uh, by looping around this pinning point, uh, these screw dislocations can actually act as sources of dislocations, as dislocation sources. Hmm? We'll, t we'll talk about this in a moment. Okay. Um, right, so let's say something about this uh, interesting aspect of dislocations. When you uh, take a piece of iron, alpha iron, pure iron, and um, you strain it, and you measure the density, yes, uh, you find that uh, the more you strain, the lower the density is. It's not a big effect, but it's there. You know? So. Uh, it, this is the decrease in density. Uh, so the more you strain the material, the, the higher the decrease in, um, 
in, in the density. It's a measurable effect. And the reduction in density is due to, first of all, to two effects. Is first of all, the lattice dilatation that usually surrounds the dislocation core. Hmm? And the vacancies that are formed by the motion of sessile jogs. So the, the jogs that I just uh, uh, drew you tend to be vacancy producing jogs. So let's read what's on the slide here. Uh, plastic deformation gives you a significant increase in point defects, in particular vacancies, yes. And because the, uh, the concentration of vacancy is much larger what than the thermodynamically stable concentration, we talk about excess vacancies, hmm? excess vacancies. Um, so, uh, yes, and you can also form vacancies and self-interstitials, but that happens at higher temperatures uh, when the dislocations, edge dislocations, move out of their glide plane. That, that happens with edge dislocation. It's a, it's a high temperature effect usually. Hmm? Is, uh, if you have a dislocation here, yes, hmm? and this is the extra half plane, this dislocation doesn't have to stick to its glide plane. Yes? It can, it can move to a higher glide plane without the processes of uh, chalk formation that I just described. That happens at high temperatures. At high temperatures, dislocations can climb out of their glide plane by absorbing or emitting point defects. Yes. So, for instance, uh, if this um, uh, extra half plane uh, absorb uh, emits, let's say, a uh, an interstitial atom. Yes. Yes, it's, so then it will move up one lattice plane, yes? And it will have created an interstitial atom. So that, that, that kind of motion, dislocation motion, yes, which is not glide, yes, we call non-conservative motion of dislocation. So. Right. Um, we, we know from measurements that um, we produce about 10 times more vacancies as a result of deformation than interstitials. Mm -hmm. And the values can re reach as high as 10 to the minus 4, and th that this is it's really high value. It's close to uh, melting uh, temperature concentration of vacancies. Mm -hmm. And so and as a result, you get a... Uh, a um, an increase in volume per for the same number of, of atoms. Yeah, right. So let's um, let's have um, uh, a look at uh, whether we can calculate uh, this uh, increase in or decrease in density rather. Hmm? Um, so we'll just uh, simply calculate the effect of the lattice dilatation associated with dislocations. Um, the lattice dilatation, yes, in a, uh, a around the core of an edge dislocation corresponds to per lattice plane that's threaded by the dislocation th to an addition of two vacancies. It's as the, you know, the, the, the local density, uh, local uh, 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 concentrations of vacancies around the core, yes, when you add its equivalent, yeah, the lattice expansion as well, is equivalent to adding two vacancies. Yeah? So let's, uh, okay, so you'll ask me, well, how do you know this, right? Well, first of all, there are measurements, and then there is a technique um, called uh, positron annihilation spectroscopy, which allows you to study uh, 
point defects in metals. Yeah? Um, and from these studies, we can, we can learn a lot about you know, how many defects we create in, in, um, in, um, in, these, um, in, in materials like steel or, or iron, yes? And, um, and, and find out these things. You know? So uh, let's see what we do here. Hmm? Uh, well, we could, let's uh, see what happens in, uh, in, in gamma iron. We, t we take a cube of, uh, a very large cube of gamma iron, uh, uh, one meter cube in size. Lattice uh, parameter is 0.36. And uh, we have, uh, dislocations, the density is uh, rho d, mm -hmm. and each dislocation creates a lattice dilatation of equal to two atoms uh, volumes per plane that it threads. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you can calculate the number of iron atoms in a cubic meter, yeah, simply um, by, um, with this formula here, so that's a lot of atoms. Then you can calculate the number of vacancies, yeah? and, and basically uh, you just uh, count the number of uh, 110 planes yes? in, in a meter here. Yes? You count the number of the length of this location that you have, so that gives you, uh, and you multiply by two, that you know, gives you the amount of vacancies that you've created. Yeah? So you have basically this number of atoms and this number of vacancies. And then you can calculate the, uh, the density with and without the, uh, these vacancies and calculate the decrease in density. And, and, and you get this number, you know, this number multiplied with the dislocation density. So if you, know, if you work this out, you'll find values that are um, you know, comparable to, to uh, what is measured here. Um, and um, you can also use this, this method, and some people have used it, um, to measure dislocation densities. Uh, these uh, density measurements are small, but they're measurable. You just need a, a good uh, density, but, but uh, conventional uh, density measurement, yes? And uh, you measure it as a function of strain you assume, as I've said here, that you know, you're around two atoms, uh, two vacancies added per threaded plane, um, and, um, and you'll get your dislocation density. Yeah? Pretty unusual way to determine dislocation density, but it works. Um, the, uh, right, is that's, yes, that's what I wanted to say. Oh yeah, then you probably wonder, well, you know, uh, don't you make an error? Don't you make an error because they're, they're like thermodynamically stable vacancies? You're right, but at room temperature, their number is very, very, very much smaller than the, the vacancies you've created by, oh, sorry, the, the volume change you've, uh, you have uh, generated uh, by deformation. All right, so now, now we come to um, the aspect of the generation of dislocations, yeah, and um, the um, uh, generation of dislocation is um, usually what what we um, uh, we say is that dislocations are, are generated by Frank Reed sources, mm -hmm. um, and uh, Frank Reed source you can. Um, Make, have them in um, FCC or uh, BCC uh, metals and alloys. Uh, here we'll, we'll just illustrate it with the um, uh, for uh, BCC iron. Hmm? And um, this process is called double cross slip. Yes? It's double cross slip, which is something I just explained to you. Yes? Is one of the mechanism by which we can make Frank Reed source in uh, in BCC uh, in BCC metals actually uh, BCC metals and alloys. Okay, so how does it work? Yeah, and um, right. So 
the, so the, the, the top picture is, is again, um, something uh, we had, uh, we, we've illustrated here. So what, what we have is a, uh, right. okay, let's do it like this. So we, we go back here to our... So here I have a screw, this again, a, a, a 1.0 plane. Um, this, this is... Um, yes, okay. Now I want you to imagine that um, there are 1.1.0 planes parallel, right? This, this is the, not the only 1.1.0 planes. There's many of them are parallel to each other. So and um, here... Our dislocation has made a jog, yes, and um, and it's decided to glide on this one, this glide. Mm -hmm. So so here I had my Burgess vector is like here. My Burgess vector here is like here, and and here I also have Burgess vector like the same Burgess vector. And these are the the jogs, right? Okay. And I've told you that the jogs are not, they're, they're kind of sessile, they, they just don't move, yes? Because the dislocation is, see the dislocation moving on this plane, yeah? Uh, this little uh, piece of dislocation, yeah, uh, has a Burgess vector, yeah? And a, a line that's not on the glide, it's not a glide, uh, gliding um, situation, right? So it's basically stuck there, yeah? And so this dislocation here can expand. Will if when I increase the force, it will expand and become very very large like this. So this is what is happening here. So under the uh, effect of a, a, a externally applied uh, stress, I will have shear stresses on the glide plane and the dislocation will uh, become half circle, yes? And, and then I, I should have brought this with me uh, because you can actually illustrate this very nicely, is that uh, the, the, uh, once your, the radius of this uh, dislocation uh, segment is half the distance between these two uh, edge jogs, yes? The stress needed to increase the diameter, yes, of this, um, of this uh, dislocation loop decreases, right? It, it actually decreases. Uh, I don't know if you've ever tried to squeeze a balloon between two poles, yes? You, at the beginning it's difficult, but once you have reached, the balloon has reached a certain uh, size on the, on the other side of the poles, it, plops, it flops through all by itself. I don't know if you've never, ever done this. I, I, I was going to illustrate this. So this is this instability point, you know? That instability point is, is precisely this. You, the loop will spontaneously expand after you've reached this critical value uh, of the radius. Um, so the radius being half the distance between those two pinning points. So the loop expands, continues to expand, and it curls back like this way. And what happens um, here, yes, so let's do this as an exercise. So our Burgess factor was this. This was the, this is the two pinning points, yes. And now, so these are the two pinning points and the dislocation has now expanded to this shape. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So, um, so Burgess factor is the same everywhere, right? It's, it doesn't, this, 
So this is the Burgess vector of these two pieces. Hmm? So now let's say we, um, we have um, chosen this as our line direction. Hmm? So uh, that means that I follow the line. So on this side, this is the line direction. On this side, the line direction is in this direction. Okay? Okay? So, um, so let's look on, on this side. I have line direction is in this direction. Um, the Burgess factor points to the uh, right here. So I... Yes? So if I look in this direction, hmm, down the slip plane, this here has the... It's an edge dislocation with the extra half plane below the glide plane. This one here, now I, uh, yeah, so my, um, um, so this is the, uh, the line direction, the Burgess factor, so my extra half plane is on top, comes from the top, so like this. What do we remember? Two dislocations, edge dislocations, on the same glide plane. Yeah? On the same glide plane. Uh, yeah? On the same glide plane. Yeah? Uh, so they will, um, uh, different signs, yes? They will attract each other. They all attract each other. Yes, so you, re you remember this, this curve, right? Like this and, and this one here. This is actually the one for this condition. Yeah. Um, here we have a we have situation where, where y is zero. Yeah. Yeah. Y is zero. So I think this was x over y. Yes. So. Uh, x over y is uh, infinite, right? So th it's uh, basically an attractive interaction. Hmm? And of course when they attract each other, yes, uh, these two will uh, just annihilate. Yes? They will recreate. A, 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 yeah? And when they do this, uh, so your dislocation ends up, it basically is pinched off. Yeah. So this is also very interesting about dislocation. They can disappear suddenly, right? and this is what happens. These two uh, 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 edge parts will just disappear. They leave behind a dislocation loop, yes, and uh, they leave behind this segment here, yes, which is actually nothing else than the original segment, and the process can repeat itself. Now, can it repeat itself forever? It's a good question. Well, let's see. This is just in preparation for something in the future. But um, if you have a dislocation loop, and then this thing creates another dislocation loop, yeah? and another dislocation loop, yeah? if I look on this side, yes, so this was a, so yes, if I look on this side, here I have edge dislocations, yes, and uh, yes, so, and this was my uh, vector along the dislocation line. So all the dislocations here look like this. Yes, so they all repel each other, yes. So if we reach, for instance, a grain boundary here, yes, these dislocations will, will stop moving, yes, and they will repel each other, making it harder and harder for us, yeah, because of this back stress, making it harder and harder for us to make new dislocations, okay? 
and that basically stops the production of the uh, of new dislocations. So this is a very important uh, mechanism uh, in in iron and steel, ferritic steel, BCC iron, um, related to the uh, internal generation of dislocations in in uh, in BCC iron. Okay. Right, so what is, uh, uh, what is this, uh, this, this stress relation? Well, it's very, we have seen this before, right? How, what does it take, what uh, shear stress does it take to get a certain radius, right? We know this formula, we've, we've used it to calculate, for instance, what was the stress in this fatigued sample. I used this with the TM. A picture. So we use the same uh, formula, which relates the shear stress on the dislocation and the glide plane on the dislocation and the radius. Yes. And say um, if we have uh, uh, 82 uh, gigapascal shear uh, 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 shear modulus and a Burgess factor of 0.248. Uh, which would be about the story for uh, the situation for uh, alpha iron. Uh, this formula basically tells us uh, about 10 divided by r gigapascal. Yeah? So that means that our, uh, the, the shear stress required to activate uh, Frank Reed source, yes, mm -hmm. um, will decrease with increasing. Um, uh, increasing uh, length here. When they're far apart, it's easier to, to generate this location than when it's very, very than when the points are very close. So, uh, so diagram here is uh, so the the you have an increase with a decrease in r. So this is one it, it goes as, it's linear with one over r. Okay. So when the when your uh, 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 edge jogs are very close to each other, it's harder to initiate, uh, uh, to get Frank Reed sources to, to, uh, to activate Frank Reed sources than when they're far apart. Hmm? It's kind of interesting, right? Isn't that interesting? Because if you make your um, Grain size, for instance, very very small, yeah, really small, like uh, you know a few hundred or fifty uh, nanometers. What happens then? Obviously, these two points, yes, have to be within the crystal, right? So it basically also means that when you make very small crystals, it becomes very hard to generate dislocations, right? And if you could generate them, these whatever pinning points would be so close to each other, yes, that you'd really need huge forces to get them to make dislocations, right? You know, it's one of the reasons, you know, uh, amongst many, why uh, nanostructured uh, materials uh, their plasticity cannot depend only on dislocations because you know uh, you, there is a fundamental problem about even making them. Okay. The other thing is, of course, because the grain size is so small, very quickly, even if you manage to make, uh, even if you manage to make. Uh, activate Frank Reed sources, they quickly run into uh, barriers, fundamental barriers, grain boundaries to their glide, right? And again, you cannot generate uh, many dislocations, as many dislocations, and so it has, a, it has an impact on your uh, plasticity. Hmm? So, so this, uh, is, I mean, this is a real simple formula, but it, you know, it's, it's um, it has a key uh, key meaning, and um, 
um, a key meaning, and it's it's and it's also actually quite useful because it it uh, it the 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 kind of uh, results you get from it, numbers you get from it, are very realistic. Hmm? Okay. Right. So um, let's close this uh, bit here by um, talking, uh, uh, say, a few things about um, point defects in in uh, in iron in particular uh, vacancies and, dis and interstitials. But before I, uh, I do this, I, uh, I think I'll t we'll take a break, yes? And um, for um, until um, 20 past five, and then we'll, we'll finish. Uh, we'll restart it uh, in about you know, less than 10 minutes, so I get a chance to uh, drink something. <laughs>